Hi, I'm Francesca Pastine, owner of Pastine Projects. Thank you for tuning in to our Zoom talk tonight. Pastine Projects opened its door on September 4th this year. This is our second show, and I am thrilled to highlight the remarkable work of Oakland artist Carrie Lederer and New York artist Leonard Rosenfeld, whose life spanned from 1926 to 2009. During COVID, like many other people, I had too much time to dream. With office rents dropping, I thought I could find my husband, an architect, a larger office, and just maybe it would have a space for me to do something different in, like start a gallery. When we saw the space at 360 Langton Street, we knew it was absolutely the right one. And sure enough, the gallery space is like a jewel box, perfectly suited for intimate art exhibits. My goal is to champion established and mid-career artists who have contributed to the culture of the Bay Area. Carrie Letter was one of the first artists I asked to join the gallery. She has exerted enormous influence in the Bay Area, both through her curatorial work as well as a well-known and respected artist. Throughout the years, she has developed a remarkable portfolio that includes installations, murals, individual paintings, and commissions. I also wanted to induce, uh, introduce Leonard Rosenfeld's work to a Bay Area audience. Full disclosure, Leonard Rosenfeld is my father. It was a great privilege that I can show his work in my gallery, something I am sure he would never have imagined. The consummate artist, he devoted his whole life to his studio work and his art reflects that commitment. When considering who to pair Len's work with, Carrie immediately came to mind. Seemingly disparate at first sight, the exhibit Affinities illuminates how both artists have cultivated a singular voice through inventive imagery, a great sense of humor, and a painterly use of iconically iconoclastic materials. Both had a deep connection to their environments. Leonard, through his culturally rich and multi-ethnic Lower East Side neighborhood, as well as the larger global events that define the moments of his life. Carrie found insights into the natural world through the evolving ecosystems in her Oakland garden and their connection to her larger issues like how we use the land. The exhibit will be extended until the 18th, so you still have time to um, come this weekend um, if you haven't already. And um, now we'll hand the talk over to Carrie Lederer. Oh, it's great to be here tonight. I want to start by thanking Francesca for the invitation to show with the gallery and to be here tonight to talk about my work. It's, it's such an honor to be a part of this project. Um, I'm also thrilled to have this opportunity to show with New York artist Len Rosenfeld, who is an amazing artist and such an inspiration as, and as Francesca touched on a little bit, you know, our work is very different, but it dovetails on in so many ways on so many different levels. So that was a really um, wonderful surprise for me. Um, the images that I'm gonna share tonight are a mix of both my studio work and uh, public art projects. And for me, um, the work continues to be a meditation on nature, um, a daily poem, if you will, um, as I travel uh, the path of building an artwork. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd start tonight with this piece. It's titled Magic in the Hinterland. And though it's not, not in the exhibition, I think it's a really good example of my focus on making work that's nature-based and imagery that's anchored in our relationship uh, to, the, to the natural world. Um, this, uh, this whole series uh, is, um, uh, they're, they're like surreal landscapes or vistas that have a sense of wonder or mystery embedded in them. And uh, they always have this very dense tapestry-like format that is um, haphazard and has a tangled sensibility, but, but, but bursting with color. Um, 
Oh, I, there was one thing I wanted to mention. This, this, this is the piece um, in the in the intro. We mentioned that there was a um, commission for UCSF for the um, their new hospital in San Francisco, and this, along with another sister piece, were the pieces that I made for the hospital. And because it was slated for uh, the pediatric ward, um, I built into the pieces this little treasure hunt. And in this case, it was find the fox. And so if you if you delve into these pieces, there are little foxes that are embedded and hidden throughout the, throughout the work. Uh, this next piece called Casting into the Deep is, is continuing with this, with this imagery. And in fact, there's another little fox who's making his way through the, the chaotic terrain, which is teeming with activity. And well, these works seem to not have a floor plan. Um, for me, like our natural world, one pocket of activity um, with these various um, pieces, one pocket of activity and, 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 um, and plant life entwines to the next, very much like the ecosystem in our natural world. Um, the imagery is always very ordered, but also in disarray. Uh, there are realistic elements, but also parts of the painting that fall entirely into abstraction. And on the, on the top right, you'll see um, that the painting also has these tufts of embroidery thread that are protruding out of this, out of the, the, the painting, kind of activating the surface. Um, this is um, a temporary mural that I made for uh, the city of Palo Alto. It's called Lost in My Abstracted Garden. And it's located in uh, downtown at, the Cal, uh, at their Caltrans station which is very urban, uh, it's a very cement covered area. And because of this, I wanted to create what would seem like a window into, into nature, a portal of sorts that um, would capture the rambunctious and colorful uh, beauty in nature and really kind of be a celebration of the infinite and wondrous life forms that, that are found in nature. This is a full uh, screenshot of the entire mural and the next are a few details. Um, my, my focus with this piece was really to create this weave of imagery with flora and fauna that are camouflaged into one another and sometimes overlapping or, or morphing into each other. And you can see at the bottom, there's like this wolf and a little, a little bird. Um, in the bottom of this detail, there's this um, um, abstracted water-like image. Um, and uh, many different types of uh, uh, plant life and discovery, because what I really was striving for with this mural was to create something that would be uh, that would attract people of all ages that would have these interactive elements that would be full of discovery and surprise and and my challenge for this project was to visually convey um, natural aspects of nature so like the from the rustle of wind to the flow of water. Um, the chatter of animals, but in my vocabulary. Um, this, uh, in um, right before pandemic, I was invited by Facebook uh, to um, do a project for their artist in residence program. And uh, this was a 10 by 40 foot wall, a mixed media wall, and it was called The Land of Magic Awaits. And this was really, uh, this project was a sea change for my work, given the size and the scope and the materials that I ended up using, which included everything from paint and glitter to little glass eyes that were embedded throughout the walls to silk flowers and pom-poms. Um, and the implied message for all these Facebook workers was just to see the environment and be and be enveloped by it, um, be enveloped by it from the from the darkest resource, re recesses of Earth's soil out onto the out to the cosmos, and also just that we're a part of a greater whole. You know, from large from the large expanses of the sky to the small tiny birds you might find nestled into the into the into the bushes. Um, this was an idea that um, I continue to try and portray in all of the work that I do in my studio. And um, these are just some details of the, of the mural. There's a, on the left is one of the pom-poms. Um, this piece is titled uh, Deep in the Willow Wax. It's about uh, 36 by 45 inches. And like much of my work, it's, it stems from a, a personal curiosity about nature and also a fascination 
with nature's immense power and with, with, the, with just the stunning beauty. Um, I like to combine patterns that are found in nature with abstracted shape and then focus on these really delicate, minute natural systems that sometimes are unnoticed or completely unseen. Um, so this is, I feel like this is a nice, um, this piece is a nice portrayal of my interest in both the micro and macro perspectives of nature and also imagery that conveys everything from the big, bold statements to very delicate um, forms that exist in the realms around us. Um, this piece deep in the willow wax is what the imagery that was used to develop my, my Facebook um, project. These two pieces are actually in the show at the Pastine um, Projects Gallery. Um, they're from a series that um, uh, I've been working on called My Abstracted Garden. This is Abstracted Garden One and Three, and you know they're 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 basically they're imaginary portraits of my of my own garden. The colors, the textures, the climate, the the bird song, you know, the soil, the water. Um, I'm I'm using just this again this wealth of of material, everything from fabric and glitter to small silk flowers or pieces of filament. Um, and I just, I like finding ways to use man-made materials or constructed nature to create these, these surreal landscapes and then coupling them with paint to portray the idea of these elements in nature that are circulating to and from and around each other, um, kind of like a functioning unit within, within this little abstract landscape. These two little pieces are quilt constellations that are actually in LA right now at a gallery called Idlewild in the event that you're heading to LA. Uh, this, um, this piece is called Finding My Way, Wandering a Lot. And it was made last year at the height of COVID lockdown and also during our frightening summer fires. And the neon pigment for me really helped describe the intensity of climate and the potential perils of, of, um, of, of a warming earth. And while this piece isn't in the exhibition, um, Francesca has uh, several of these pieces from this series in her flat files. So if you visit the gallery, I really encourage you to see if she'll give you a tour of her flat files because she's got work by all the artists in the gallery. It's really fun and exciting to do. It's just really satisfying. Um, the next two pieces are also part of my abstracted garden series, and they're homages to women in my family who introduced me to the love of nature and, and, and of textiles. Um, this first piece is um, called My Abstracted Garden, homage to Great Aunt Chuni. Um, she's Finnish. And um, this piece is built with like an ornate composition of of small pieces of fabric and fur and yarn and thread to portray ideas about land, about how we use land, about how we divide it up. And, and also this uh, to get at this idea of looking at land from an aerial view. So it becomes almost an island-like image. Uh, and this is an homage to my grandma Helmi. Um, both my great aunt and grandma were gardeners and farmers and quilters and bakers. And they lived up in a Finnish community in the upper peninsula of Michigan, where the winters often last until May and offer up like 10 feet of snow every year. But I cherish my summers that I spent there as a child on their farms where I learned so much about sewing and gardening and hard work and recycling and most importantly about living well with very little. Um, this is another exciting uh, temporary uh, mural project that I just recently did in downtown Menlo Park and it's located at the Menlo Park Teen Center. Um, it's five feet high, 15 feet long, and the piece is titled Under the Great Sky We Gather. Um, and it brings this wonderful splash to a wall that was very dreary and very white and empty. And I just want to take a minute to shout out uh, the, and thank um, Elevate Art Menlo Park, which is a group of community members who took it upon themselves to start a nonprofit 
and with the goal of mounting public art in their community. This is something that cities usually do. This is, a, this is the job of a municipality. And these folks just stepped up and fundraised and I was their first artist out the gate and I was so proud to be a part of the project. Um, the, um, much of my work, um, as you can see, it really explores the, the, the convergence of our natural environment with the universe or the cosmos. And, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in this idea of the order beneath the confusion that's found in both of these worlds, in, in, in nature and in, in the cosmos. And so I wanted this mural to incorporate this idea of that, you know, that, that order beneath the confusion um, and, uh, you know, f find an image that was where, where there was this sense of order coupled with a cacophony of, of, of imagery. Um, the day that we unveiled it was a Sunday afternoon, and it was so sweet. This young gal was coming out of Sunday school and came right up to the mural and began to give us all a tour. And amazingly, she was, she was dressed to match. Uh, this summer, I was commissioned by the Hudson Valley Seed Company in upstate New York to create an artwork for their 2021 seed packet series. And my image, you get you. They 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 choose set, uh, ten artists every year, and they assign you a species. And I was assigned the purple perfume Nicotiana, because the Nicotiana, the purple perfume Nicotiana, at dusk and dawn in particular, are very fragrant. And um, so my challenge was to somehow portray portray the flower, but also portray that that magic and mystery that happens. Like why is this flower? particularly fragrant at those times. It's that's so fabulous and wonderful to me. Um, this is the actual seed packet, which is available on their website right now and soon mine. And um, these are a couple of details. Um, I, you know, one of the, um, as a resource for my work, I, I mine so many, so many things for inspiration. I mean, Indian miniatures and Persian rugs and the shape of nature, of course, but also especially fractals. Um, and I'm sure many of you know fractals are this complex geometric figure that's made up of patterns that repeat itself each time on a smaller scale. And each smaller version is referred to as um, self-similar in form. And um, what I really love about fractals is they, you know, they basically tell the story of all the wild transformations in nature that are taking place on a daily basis and, and you know, kind of giving order to a chaotic world of energy and change on, a, on, on, this, on this daily basis. I'm, I'm just so charmed and fascinated by these natural wonderments, but also nature's intrinsic capacity to create and reproduce patterns. I mean, how amazing is that? So it's a, it's a constant source of, of, of inspiration for me. Um, in closing, I have just a, another image here. Um, I have a piece from a series called Notations on Land. And this is a series I've been doing um, in my studio on graph paper. They're meant to be study-like um, in terms of looking at land and thinking about land. Um, this piece has a subtitle called Grassy Lands. Um, but for me, the garden has really become a metaphor for the universe in my work, um, where, again, as I said, just this opportunity to channel both micro and macro, um, the bold and, 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 and dominating things in nature versus these delicate forms that need to be called out and, and highlighted. And then to use paint and fabric and various materials to knit it all together and describe what land has to offer is, um, is, always, my, is always my challenge. Um, I mean, nature does indeed provide endless inspiration and imagery. So I will close with a thanks to mother nature and for her astonishing beauty and what seems to be just a, a boundless well of resource and res research for my work. Thank you so much. Okay, I can exit. Stop screen share. Thank you, Carrie. That was fantastic. It was so enriching to hear what you had to say about your work.
So now I'm going to share my screen and we, we will go to Janet Hoffman. Do you want... All right, Janet. Okay, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was great, Carrie. It's fantastic. And thank you for connecting us to nature. I have to tell you that living in the asphalt jungle of New York, it was so refreshing and wonderful and um, a great inspiration. And I do see the synergies. You do use uh, unusual objects and your work does have a tactile, a tactile sense to it. Um, and I think that's why Francesca thought of the two of us to, to get together um, because Len also used um, unusual objects and found objects and his work is touchable as it touches you. Anyway, um, when Len came into New, into New York art scene after World War II, abstract expressionism was in full swing. And he, although he admired the likes of de Kooning and Klein and Jackson Pollock, he decided he was not gonna go that way. He said, that's been done. What do I have to add? And he found his own voice. He was actually very influenced by German expressionism. Painters like Oskar Kokoschka, Max Beckman, Emil Nolde, as well as the French expressionist Chaim Soutine. And you can see this in his very bold and gritty railroad and construction drawings that he did in 1957. Here you see a photograph of Len at the Brooklyn Museum, the photos courtesy of the Brooklyn Museum archives, 1960, standing in front of one of his railroad drawings. Other artists in the show included Philip Perlstein, Larry Rivers, and some of these works were also shown at the Martha Jackson Gallery in 1965. Len did these pieces right on site, on the, on the ground. And then he would finish them, he sketched them out, and then he'd finish them on, at home. And one day, he liked to tell the story about how one day on a very windy day, the paper was flying around on, as he was on the ground working on it. And suddenly he saw two feet standing on the edges of the paper and he looked up and it was one of the engineers who was posted in the uh, tower in the rail, rail yard. He told Len to finish the work and invited him up to the tower to share his lunch with Len. So Len was very grateful for the invitation despite his fear of heights. He was always ready for good conversation and a free lunch. Len was also very inspired by the works of Vincent van Gogh. And uh, in fact, in an interview in 1986, he was asked what made him become an artist and his life doing this. He said, well, I went to a show of Van Gogh work at the Law Library in New York City. And when I left that exhibition, I knew that I would spend the rest of my life painting. Now, in this next image, you can see this one is, we're going a little bit out of order, but the, the, the wire piece. This is uh, called 11618653. 11. So one one six one eight six eight five three, and I'll let you guess what that number means. It's quite large. It was done in 1984, and here you see the artist uh, with a blonde pompadour. Len had blonde pompadour when he was young. I sometimes like to call this piece Len as Elvis. Um, this is one of the first pieces uh, in his wire piece series that he did in the 1980s. I'm taking a little bit out of order because he dedicated this piece to Vincent van Gogh. On the back, it's written to Vincent VG. The piece is made of, of this is carpet tack, attaching um, wire and chicken wire around, and then there's two leather pockets. Um, next, you're gonna see the scope of this piece. This is an invitation to a show at, Leonard, at um, Michael Kisling Gallery in um, 1995 in Soho. Len was about six feet tall. So you, this gives you a sense of the size of this piece. Um, and I remember Francesca wondering why he would appear in shorts when the exhibition took place in the middle of winter, but he was an outlaw. And we'll take a few, uh, look at a few other of these works as we uh, get back to the 1980s. But we're gonna go back in chronology a little bit. Um, Len spent much of the 1960s on oil paintings on canvas. To him, this was the most challenging medium. Many of these were of the space program and astronauts. He was always ahead of his time. This was done in 1966 at 73 inches by 70, oil on canvas. 
Len was prescient, not only about the space program big time, but also representing an astronaut of color. And he also did women astronauts. The first flights of black and women astronauts didn't even happen until 1983. He also painted a work called Goodbye Columbia well before the Columbia Space Shuttle's tragic demise in 2003. Again, he was ahead of his time. Len, above all, was a narrative artist. He was a journalist and a storyteller on canvas. Among the subjects he painted about were the prostitutes and pimps who populated his downtown neighborhood for many years. And here's an example. This one is called The Remembrance of Things Past. It's done in 1984. It's watercolor and crayon on canvas, 27 by 28. Len loved titles. They were almost as important to him as the work itself. And if you look closely at this painting, and it's something I didn't notice for a long time until I saw him interviewed about this on an old TV program, there's an image of a slave ship in the back. It looks as if there's a black man with his hands on his head and someone jumping into the water. Perhaps it reflected Len's views on the captive-like nature of the oldest profession. As many as the young women he used to see in his neighborhood were African-American. You can also see the influence of Dutch masters uh, with this big Franz Hals hat. You know, Franz Hals painted, did all these paintings with big, big hats. And he was very uh, connected to the, to the old masters and to the history of art. And it often appears in his work. Len used to like to tell the story about how he would walk out on his stoop and some of the ladies would be there. And inevitably, one of them would walk up to him, grab his crotch and say, how about a date, Pop? And his answer was always, stay cool, baby. And they would all laugh hysterically. There is a painting by that name, by the way, Stay Cool Baby, hanging in the home of a Swedish collector. Moving right along, we get to one of Len's most important series. This piece is hanging in the gallery right now. It's called Chinatown. And Len, these are Len's words of how this came about. In 1982, I found a piece of electric wire in the floor of my studio. I nailed the wire onto the stretcher bar using carpet tacks, and I liked the way it looked. And I did it until the wire pushed the strips of canvas off the stretcher. At first, I used only black and white wire. After, I started to use colored wire. Sometimes other materials join the wire, like cotton, silk, and fur. Now, it has been said that Len gave up oil painting for wire because oil paint was expensive. And you could buy, you could use found wire, you could buy wire very inexpensively on Canal Street. However, in one of his inter interviews in the mid 1980s, he said he got tired of stretching canvases, and that's why he did this. For whatever reason, he spent most of the 80s creating and showing these works. I think it could simply have been that he wanted to do something new. He was always looking for something new. This one's called Chinatown, the Year of the Fish. There is no Year of the Fish, he made it up. The piece has to do with Len's life. He lived in downtown near Chinatown in a neighborhood which came to be populated by a large Asian community pushing the pimps and hookers out. This is where he shopped for food and went out to eat. It was very affordable to a hungry artist on a meager veteran's pension. The lettering at the top represents a kind of fish. That's what my sources tell me, it means fish. Then you have a benignly depicted Asian person holding a fan in very delicate hands, the same hands holding chopsticks below, eating fish. The figure, like Len, has blue eyes, and the hands are kind of strong but delicate, like the hands of an artist. Len felt a real kinship with his Chinese neighbors. Then below, you see a domestic situation. You see people, you see a house, you see people cooking and eating, you see people fighting, and then making love. On the edges, you see the fish scales and everything, the fear of the fish. The story about life in this order reminds me of an argument Len had once in a cantina in Mexico in a little town. The Mexican guys are saying, well, what comes first in life? Love comes first. And Len said, no, he disagreed. He said, no, food comes first then art, then friends and games, then love. Well, if you don't have food, you can't have those other things, can you? Food was very important to Len. 
He grew up during the Depression. His widowed mother did her best, but they never had enough to eat. And his first three squares a day were in the Army in World War II. Uh, we're going to look at another two of these wire pieces. This one's called Jailhouse Love. It's a real beauty. It's very, very tactile. If you can zoom in on it, the hair of the woman, the hand of the man. It's a really lovely piece, and it and it and it reverberates. You know, the, the article that Julia Cousins wrote about the show talked about the tactile nature of Len's work and Carrie's work. This you can touch, you know, and it touches you really. The grid on the other side is obviously in this context, the bars that you find in, in the jailhouse and prison. And that image appears in later works. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, later. And the next piece, uh, well, if you sc scroll up a little bit, you can see what the size is. These are big pieces. Um, right, this is 48 by 63. It's interesting, it shows a span of time in which he made the work. Uh, he would start them and work on them over time, doing other things in the meantime that were less demanding. Okay, here we have Luego Caballo. It's a self-portrait. That's Len with his, with his glasses and his beard and a horse. It literally means then horse. And I'll leave to the Spanish scholars the significance of that, but... Um, Again, this speaks to his love of Mexico, where he spent a great deal of time. And you could say that Len was also influenced by, very much by the great Mexican muralists like Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, and Alfaro Siqueiros. He met Siqueiros a number of times when he was in Mexico, and uh, that's a story for another time. Maybe it has something to do, Luego Caballo, with closing the barn door after the horse escapes or is stolen. Len did quite a number of these works until the end of the 80s, and many of them are in private collections, and one of them is in the collection of the New Britain Museum of American Art in Connecticut. By the early 90s, however, he was looking for the next thing, something new, and he found it while walking along in the banks of the East River. He picked up some spray cans, took them home, sat in Sarah Roosevelt Park in front of his building, punched holes in them, with nails and crush them so the paint would come out. He was quite selective in what he picked up. If you look closely, you can see words like flat, gunk, tapas, um, gold touch scent, some of which are partial words where he let the paint cover the rest. And then he nailed the crushed spray cans to the empty stretchers, adding drawings and graphite. Here you see, this one is called Hung Up Running Shoe with Man, it was made in 1991, uh, 69 by 35. Here you have two self-portraits bearing the detritus that he found on the marquee. He, he found a shoe, an Adidas sneaker on the marquee of his building, cut it up and incorporated it in this work. On the top, you can see the uh, shoe, it's, it's almost like a hat, the tongue of the shoe in the mouth. And then at the bottom, the, uh, the shoe, like his nose, and this is a great example of where he transitioned from the wire to the cans, because he still has the wire, the brain, the chin, the neck. Actually, you know, this, this particular, these pieces, the wires and cans and the, um, the wire pieces and the cans, uh, was the first time Len felt that he was in sync with what was going on the current movement in the art world. New Wave, represented also by artists such as Julian Schnabel with his broken plate paintings and the works of, of Jean-Michel Basquiat. And though Len usually avoided identifying with any movement, he did consider himself a uh, part of the New Wave. And next you're going to see a couple of drawings. This, well, this drawing, as you can see, he did drawings before he did the, the, the big pieces on stretchers. And this is almost an exact replica of what he used in the piece that you just saw. And the next one is also a drawing that was done in the same period, 1990. This one's 26 by 22. The other one was a 23 by 18. This is a good example of his use of a grid, as we talked about before. 
It is called Blue Jew in a Sun Hat Half Imprisoned. Also depicted is the sun hat that he used to wear on his frequent excursions to Brighton Beach, which he used to call the poor man's Hamptons. So after what was clearly a very physically demanding rigors of the wire and can works, Len needed a break. So he embarked on what he called his romance with watercolors, producing a series of brightly colored dynamic paintings of graffiti artists whose work appeared at the time on the walls, subway cars, and other spaces in New York City. Unlike Len, I suppose many people found the graffiti to be a form of desecration. But Len was intrigued and he depicted them as benign figures. This one is called Toucan Toya, 28 by 42, watercolor and paper. It's an example of him using fig female figures. This is a woman, Toya is a woman. And a number of these are in the flat files at the uh, gallery, and a few of them are on the wall. The numbers you see on the side are estate numbers. And before, before Len embarked on his last, his final powerful series called Soldiers and Terrorists, he did a number of smaller watercolors about the fall and rise of Coney Island and other subjects. But one poignant piece, this one's called War, painted in 1999, depicts a man running from the Twin Towers falling down. And just to give you some context, in 1993, a month after we moved into our loft, one block east of the World Trade Center, they tried to blow it up the first time. A couple years later, we were sitting on our little terrace, talking it over, and Len said, if those buildings ever came down, we would be finished. And I said, well, how could they do it? And he said, they would have to hijack planes and fly them into the buildings. I was incredulous. I remember in the 70s, when you had to point to your check baggage before they put it on the plane, because people were putting bombs in suitcases and putting them on planes. They weren't getting on the planes as human bombs. And he said, look, I'm a schmuck from Brooklyn. Put yourself in their head. They bombed the coal. They blew up our embassies in Africa. Why not here? And then it happened, just as depicted in this little painting. Len leaving the neighborhood two years later with a little backpack after the towers fell. And then he did a series, did a 9-11 series. He said he would not go near it with a 10-foot pole. Of course, being the storyteller he was, the journalist on canvas, he did a series of larger works, one of which is in the collection of the 9-11 Museum. This piece is called Kaddish. This is, this is the beginning of his soldiers and terrorists uh, series. And it was inspired by a New York Times review of a book called In the Company of Soldiers, by Rick Atkinson. Atkinson spent a lot of time with then uh, two-star General David Petraeus, who was, and Len was intrigued by the general's question. Petraeus was stationed in Iraq at the beginning of the war, and he kept asking Atkinson, tell me how this ends. In Len's words, I moved into my soldier series as a veteran haunted by the past and the future and the general's question. He said he didn't know how to characterize this series, but he said his main focus was to paint. This one is called Kaddish, which speaks for itself, Jewish prayer for the dead, 48 by 48. When he was preparing this work, I saw him kneeling on the floor, laboriously putting together two 24 by 48 stretched or stretch canvases using screws and brackets. And I said, why don't you just get a 48 by 48 stretch canvas? He said, where am I going to put that? You know, I, I could take this one apart. I don't know if I could store a 48 by 48 canvas. Well, of course, after he put this together and painted it, he never took it apart. In fact, he liked the way it looked with the crack down the middle. As a veteran, he knew firsthand that war is not a video game. It breaks people apart. It's about life and death, as clearly presented in this very expressionistic work. He was often asked why he painted the soldiers pink. One might have thought, well, they were vulnerable, they were women. No, he said, de Kooning used a lot of pink. As he said, his focus was the paint, not the subject matter. He came to be known at the Vasari paint store, though, as the Pink Man. This work is in the collection of LaGuardia College in New York City. We then had a show of these works at the President's Gallery in 2007. 
And now we get to our last image. This is called Purple Heart One, made in 2007. By 2007, Len decided he was tired of being an expressionist. Here you can see how the pieces morphed more into what Len called Warholge, with repeating images of soldiers on the grid background. He also did a lot of dots and other repeating patterns. Again, we see the grid, and I should point out that the lines that, that he drew in the grid were done freehand. He didn't measure anything. This part of the series began when we went to a, we went to a, a Christmas party and Len saw a little plastic soldier, I'll show you, on a telephone table. And he said to the hostess, do you mind if I have that? And she gave it to him. He took this and he stenciled it, stenciled it onto the back of a cereal box and cut it out. He said it was a cornflakes box, but it was a cereal box. Then he took the cardboard soldier and stenciled each individual one into the grip. Then he put it down on the, on the table and did the painting. This was the last big series he did. And Francesca's going to show the last image, which is uh, the pink man's painting table. Here you can see the cutouts. One of them is on the wall. One of them is on the paint tube, the little paper cutouts that he used, the soldier toys that he used as well. And then also you see images of, of um, the great masters on his wall. Well, Len always said that the weight of art history is always on the back of every artist. And that's how he felt. Anyway, I've done my best to provide a snapshot of his 60 year career, works from a number of these series and some others are represented at the current exhibition or available at the gallery if you wanna take a look, if you're lucky enough to be in California. And if you are interested in more biographical information and uh, other series, you can visit leonardrosenfeld.com, talk to Francesca. And that's it for now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Janet. It's a remarkable talk on just an incredible life and um, career. So thank you so much. Now, um, we'll go to Robin and um, she should um, um, read some questions. Uh, so I see in the chat, there was a lot of thank yous, but so far we don't have any real questions. So bring them on y'all. Um, Janet. Yes. Did Len seek recognition in his life? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, he was asked at one of his interviews in 1986, whether it was important to him to be famous. And he said, you know, he had already decided that he was not gonna be famous in his lifetime. What was really important to him was that he could paint, he could do his work, have it shown regularly by a gallery or galleries. And every now and then someone would take one home. In fact, it was, it was really funny, he said, during the period when the terrorist act started happening, he said, you know, I'm more likely to be in a terrorist act than get fame in my lifetime. And sadly, that's what happened. But, um, but I have to say that um, now, you know, it's the hope and expectation of those in the art field who know his work and see, and see that, that where it fits into the history of American contemporary art that this work will find its way into museums and it already has found its way into some museums as in addition to his collectors, which is also extremely important. And that it will also appear in other public venues for all the world to see. That was his hope. He said he would like to be in museums, but he didn't see it happening in his life. There's another question for Janet from Debbie Gerritsen. She says, Janet, I didn't catch why he used pink with the soldiers. <laughs> he said de Kooning used a lot of pink. 
That was always his answer. It wasn't, you know, he, he didn't like people to interpret too much. You know, he was, as a true expressionist, and he was a little provocative too. You know, he said, it's all about the paint. And it was a particular paint that he got at the Vasari store. Um, but he just, you know, he painted pink soldiers, whether they were male or female. And it was because de Kooning used a lot of pink. I'm afraid that's the best I can do on that because that's the way he would answer it. I think Jessica mentioned that the Hawaii, the Hawaii was the image on the left. Oh, right, okay, yeah, good. So we know. Um, Carrie, can you talk about the connections between uh, the garden and the cosmos? <laughs> Um, I, I mean, they're intricately, you know, you know, it's, it's above and below at all times. I think that it's just a, you know, a vital part of, of our world and our, and our, um, our small world and our big world. And I don't, I don't feel like, um, you can actually separate them. Uh, you can't have one without the other. So, I mean, our, our sky is, and our atmosphere is such a, 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 a vital part of, 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 of our world. But I think for me, the mystery beyond it, and while we do know a lot, there's a lot we don't know, is what draws me into the cosmos as, a, um, as an element in the, the vistas of the landscapes, that the surreal vistas or landscapes that I, that I, um, that I that I paint. I mean, I, I like them as a, a stand in for that mystery and for the unknown question um, for all that we don't know, but for what we do know and treasure and hold dear as well. Another question for Carrie from Janet Hoffman. Uh, she would be interested in hearing more about Carrie's process in creating the works that incorporate various objects. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I have a feeling that in this way, Len and I share uh, a lot in terms of process, because I usually do not have a plan. Um, I, mm -hmm. I uh, for when I was creating the Facebook wall, for instance, I arrived with boxes and boxes of opportunity as I, as I saw them, and then took it from there. I had, for, for the Facebook project, they give you two weeks. You got to be in and out. That's it. Um, but I really did not make a specific plan of, you know, the pom-pom is going to go here or the fur is going to be used here. I really reacted to the space and to the imagery that was being painted and all of it came together as I, as I, you know, one foot in front of the next. And as Annie Lamott says, bird by bird, you know, one thing after the next. And I, you know, I, I remember recently I had a conversation with a friend of mine about what, why we keep making art and what draws us in and what keeps, what holds our attention. And both of us agreed that not knowing what's next and not knowing how you're gonna use material and, and having that discovery is is what is what holds me for for sure mm -hmm. um because i i feel like every day i find something new in the studio and it's often because i made i had an accident or i discovered a new material or like with len with you know just picking up a, a you know a smashed uh spray paint can and figuring out that there was an image in that 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 as an object it's an image to be to be used and to be built on and I, I love that idea. I think it's so rich. Any other oh, questions? Oh, okay. Other artists. Okay. Len's relationship with other artists in the 50s. Well, you know, Len was, Len used to go to the Cedar Tavern, which was populated by the likes of Jackson Pollock had already left for the Springs. And in fact, when Len walked into the theater for the first time, Pollock had already died in that horrible car accident. And the bartender almost had a heart attack because Len looked so much like him. You could see that in that image uh, in, in the Brooklyn Museum. But, um, you know, he knew Klein and de Kooning. He talked about them a lot. 
Klein, he said, love talking about sports, de Kooning, love talking about painting. He used to pick de Kooning up from the gutter drunk with money pouring out of his pockets. And anyway, at one point, uh, he liked to tell the story about how um, Fleming Greenberg was the critic who, who supported Jackson Pollock. And he stood up in the Cedar Tavern one day and he declared that Jackson Pollock is the greatest artist of all time. De Kooning stood up and slapped him in the face. I mean, these were tough times, right? And they, they started to have a brawl and Lynn had to separate them. I mean, there was all sorts of stuff like that that went on. And, um, you know, his, he really admired those people. He, he said that Pollock really broke ground. He said, but he never thought Pollock was happy. There was a, it, I, I've been looking at a lot of, I have a lot of footage of Len painting of him talking about his work, which I'm beginning to get together to, to post on um, YouTube possibly and on his website. But he, he talked about Pollock was not happy. I guess he did sort of drink himself to death in a way, but, um, but he really admired that he broke the mold. He loved that. And, um, but you know, he he felt it had already been done, so uh, he had to do something else. Um, so his relationship was one of admiration, and watching them do their work, and you know, having De Kooning walk up to him on the street one day and say, "Len, I sold a painting for five thousand dollars. Can you imagine that? <laughs> now it would probably be five million. But uh, anyway, it was it was. It was a wild and wonderful time because people talked about art. It's not like that anymore. You know, it, when he was interviewed much later and right before he died, um, he talked about how the art world has sort of not, you know, sort of lost its camaraderie that they had in those days of people getting together. But, you know, I guess that's part of the, part of the computer world and part of the other changes with technology and all that. But I hope I answered your question, Francesca. Yes, thank you very much. There's Ron, another, com another uh, comment for Carrie from Teresa saying, after seeing the movie Fantastic Fungi, I see your work as colorful mycelium network. I love that. I actually haven't seen the film. I just saw, the, I just saw your uh, comment, Trace. So I will, I will look at it. I'm not surprised. I have a feeling it's... Uh, it's it's uh, it's probably right up my alley with a cacophony of, of of growth and color and texture and pattern, but maybe Trace can. I, I copied your chat, so I remember to check out the film. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions that you want to squeeze in? Anyone? So thank you so much uh, for joining the talk. I just feel so enriched by the conversation. And um, I hope you get a chance if you haven't already to come see the show. I think uh, it just is uh, so great how the um, works of Leonard Rosenfeld and Carrie Letter from very opposite places um, energizes the gallery with a rich assortment of material and color and um, incredible artistic investigations, original, original investigations. Um, I think the one thing that for me characterizes both artists is their they, you, they're not dated, they're not copied from any specific style from any time, they're just fresh, like fresh off the press. Um, both works could have been made by um, 20 year olds and 95 year olds at the same time. Um, just uh, really fantastic. And I hope you can come down and see the show if you're in the Bay Area or San Francisco. So that said, thank you so much, Carrie and Robin and Janet for putting together, to helping me put together this talk tonight. And thank you so much for coming, everyone. And it was great to see some familiar faces and some new faces. And thank you again, Francesca. Thank, thank you, Francesca. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. And have a great holiday. Thanks. Thanks, Francesca. Thanks, Janet. That was fantastic. I had a lot Good of to see you all. 
I hadn't seen a lot of that stuff. So it was really wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Maybe you think of the pieces I have here at home, you know? Yeah, Debbie has Debbie has a wonderful uh, graffiti piece. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. I have the lieutenant. Yeah. And, a, and a soldier. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So really happy to see the other pieces. Thank you. It was just terrific. I have a question for my sister. Janet. Did anybody else use telephone wire the way Len did? Not that I'm aware of. What's interesting is that there, 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 was, a, there was an artist, a, a woman named Shari Dienis, who died a number of years ago. And she, she did a painting called Wire Man. I wanted to buy it, but it was being restored. And, it, and then she died and I didn't have access to it. She also did a piece with a little can in it. You know, it's not something that would, you know, not occur to an artist potentially, but it, it's, it was really unique. Nobody, I don't think anybody did this. And frankly, uh, at the time that Len did the Soldier, Soldier and Terrorist series, he didn't think anybody was really painting the war out there, painting the war. And, and he was right. Yeah. So yeah. He, he, he sort of wanted to be out there where nobody else was. I also yeah. feel like Len is unique because he didn't really use the wire so much in a sculptural way, like to create stuff with, you know, bodies or figures with wires. They were very painterly. So he used them in a way that a painter would use them. And I think he identified as a painter and the wire pieces were just another iteration of painting for Len. Yeah. It just looked like he was, he just wanted to have a lot of fun. And that's what he was doing, because those, those are really nice people. <clears throat> well, thank you again, everyone. And Janet, hi, Charlie. Thanks for tuning in, and Bob. And um, so have a good night, and happy holidays. <laughs>